Hello, and thank you for joining this Flex Deep Dive session. My name is Philip Lane, and I work as a DevOps engineer at Senet. We are a Swedish-based company who builds developer-centered experiences around cloud, Kubernetes, and GitOps. I am also part of the Flux maintainer team, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So what is Flux? Well, Flux is a tool for keeping Kubernetes clusters in sync with sources of configuration. What this means is that, in basic terms, that, that you have configuration stored in, in some sort of external repository. For the most of the time, this will be Git. And then you have Flux, the tool running inside of your Kubernetes cluster that continuously synchronizes with that external repository and applies it into the cluster. This has a benefit partially due to auditability when it comes to Git, because you have a history of changes that you can see who made changes to what configuration, but also an observability uh, perspective where it is very easy to look inside the Git repository and see what is actually being applied inside of the cluster. So this is a, a, a quick overview of how, how it might look like to work with Flux. So uh, in one end, you have your deployment manifest that you are going to commit to a Git repository. On the other end of this, you have Flux. Flux is pulling the Git repository, constantly looking for changes. If a change is detected here, it will apply it to the cluster. So as you can see here, you have your deployment manifest on one end, and then your deployment on the other. Uh, this also works in the sense that if somebody were to go in and delete this uh, deployment in the cluster, Flux will eventually detect the drift between what is wanted or expected and what is actually there in the cluster and reapply the deployment. You have the possibility of really doing this as simple or as complex as possible. In this example here, it's very simple, but you can make you can scale this out to run across multiple teams and, and have different types of functionality and automation, but there isn't really any requirement to do so. So that's kind of the beauty of Flux is that it, it works for smaller teams, but it also works for large enterprises at the same time. And quickly, before we get started, I just want to go through a quick timeline of Flux and Flagger. Uh, so currently Flux is an incubation project. Uh, it has 14 maintainers at five companies. Uh, but it, it started, it, it's been around for a while now. So in 2016, it started development at WeWorks. Uh, since then, we've had uh, the Flagger project join as a sub project. For those that don't know, Flagger is a progressive delivery operator that works really well with Flux. Uh, if you're looking for a project to get involved in, I really recommend getting involved in the, in the Flux project. It's, it's really fun and we're, we're always looking for, for contributors and uh, we're happy when we see new contributors join the project. Quickly then about my journey into becoming a maintainer about uh, in Flux. So in 2018, I was working uh, as a software developer, building microservices that were deployed on a cluster orchestrator, which was not Kubernetes. Um, I was kind of looking around, looking at what other offer, like cluster orchestrators were out there. Uh, and I stumbled upon a blog post about somebody building a uh, Raspberry Pi based Kubernetes cluster. I found it kind of interesting. I wanted just to find a, a, a hobby project. So I started building one of my own. Um, somewhere after that, I realized that I wanted to have continuous delivery uh, to my new cluster. But I realized that the only way currently it was possible was to expose the Kube API server to the public internet. And I wasn't really ready to do that, mostly because it required me to open up a port in my, my home router. So I was looking around, and, I, and I'm kind of ashamed of admitting this, but uh, the only reason that I, I found Flux was because it was a continuous delivery tool that didn't require you or didn't require an external uh, resource to have access to your cluster. Um, so as Flux works by pulling an external Git repository, it worked really well with having a small cluster that could not get public IPs. Moving forward to around, well, now uh, my cluster does have the ability to get public IPs, but it still runs Flux because Flux is a great project. And I think somewhere along, along the line there, I realized how, uh, what a novel idea Flux was. Uh, so I started getting involved in the project I was using it as, at work. And uh, eventually around when, when Flux v2 uh, started picking up steam is when, when I got more and more involved and, and became a maintainer. Uh, 
so, so once again, if, if you are interested in getting involved in an open source project, uh, I think Flux is a, is a great project to, to get started in. So at Senate, we develop and operate a multi-tenant Kubernetes solution that obviously uses uh, Flux. Um, in our solution, each tenant usually represents a team or a product. Uh, when it's a product, it's usually because the teams are working on around a, a central product together. Uh, and tenants can raise uh, can rise uh, range anywhere in size between a, a couple of applications to fifty plus. Uh, we are heavy Azure users, so as you can see, we have an AKS cluster and a couple of resource groups. So each tenant is is confined by default to their own namespace within the Kubernetes cluster, um, and it's linked together to an Azure resource group. So this brings the challenge of how do we expose these uh, namespaces or tenants to our end developers in a safe and secure way, which has a, a reasonable maintainability um, in the long run when it comes to maintaining the clusters. Um, before I joined uh, Senate, uh, we were not using Flux there. Uh, and I think this is a technical deployment method that most uh, companies have been using for a while now with Kubernetes and, well, before Kubernetes. Uh, so development teams were maintaining their own CD pipelines. They would have multiple applications that would have each have a, a continuous delivery pipeline that was pushing in or that was first of all building the image and then pushing that image uh, to a uh, central registry and then it was running some sort of kubectl apply or a help install upgrade uh, command towards the cluster uh, this resulted in applications having their manifests and source code tightly coupled as each application would basically have their own unique manifest. Um, it would also require each application or at least their CD pipeline to know about the cluster. Uh, any, any changes to the cluster or, or if you wanted to replace the cluster would require you to go into, into each and every application and, and update them uh, to point them towards a different cluster. Um, and any small manifest change would, well, well, first of all, require you to rebuild the whole image as adding custom logic to detect manifest changes and skipping the build was uh, complex and it depended on if, if the teams were willing to build that type of logic. Uh, but also it would require you to trigger all of the applications. So for example, we all know that API versions is sometimes get deprecated. In a situation where we were using an old API version and we needed to upgrade the Kubernetes cluster and we need to make sure that each development team was upgrading their manifest, that would require somebody to go into 60 applications and manually uh, update or re-trigger that application to deploy a new Helm chart to the cluster. So you end up building new automation tools around automation just to manage manifests. And this is around the time that I came in and tried to bring some of my experiences that I've had in the past around Flux. So my idea was that Flux would solve a lot of the bigger issues that we're seeing with development teams, um, mostly around trying to keep what developers already knew and worked, but replace things that were still new for, for certain developers, but could simplify their lives and our lives also. Um, so after implementing Flux, one of the main benefits that we're getting is we're getting a unified enter point towards Kubernetes. Um, as it is a pool-based deployment method, we don't have to export any uh, service account tokens outside of the cluster. We don't have to configure individual deployment pipelines to tell it which cluster to look at. So this opens up opportunities of running, for example, blue-green deployments of clusters. Uh, it, it, it simplifies observability of what is being deployed. Uh, so this means that we can run automated, automated scanning tools to look at our at the developers' manifests to help them be better at, at their jobs. Uh, and changes to manifests uh, are, are easy and fast. Uh, so when we, if we, for example, come up with a new recommendation or we want to run new API versions, being able to just go into a single repository or a couple of repositories is, is way much easier or and way much better than uh, 
just having to do that for, for 50 or so. So one of the cool things with Flux is that you can run it in a multi-tenancy solution. What this means is that you can configure a single Git repository to only have access to a namespace. Uh, in this case, a tenant would have one Git repository and one namespace, and these would be linked together with Flux. So anything that you place into this Git repository would then be synchronized into that namespace. Uh, this allows for a good separation between teams where they can cooperate through opening up their namespaces with network policies, but only a specific team would have access to their own namespace. Um, because this configuration is all based on YAML, it becomes very easy to automate. So you can configure Flux in, in multiple ways. So one of them is by using the Flux CLI. Another one is using the Terraform provider, which helps you bootstrap the cluster with Terraform. Uh, and the last one is writing manifests on your own. Um, we can quickly demo onboarding a new tenant by jumping into this Terraform here. So this, is, this Terraform sets up a single AKS cluster that has three environments and it's a dev, a QA, and a production environment. If we call it out this, we're gonna set up a new tenant called tenant B. Uh, we point out the Git repository that it's supposed to synchronize from. And we first run a plan. While this plan is running, we can look at uh, the fleet info repo. So for Flux, the fleet info repository is the main repository that is initially synced from by Flux. In here, we have a tenant directory, and right now we have our tenant A configured. So the tenant A deploys a or creates a service account, a role binding, a Git repository, and a customization for this tenant. And as you can see here, it's pointing towards a separate Git repository. Uh, this Git repository is located here. So this is tenant B's Git repository, and they've been super nice that they've actually set up all the manifesting configuration before uh, or ahead of time. If you go back to our plan, it should be ready to run. So tenant B is just going to deploy a simple guestbook application, and it's going to set up a certificate and an ingress and, and a couple of pods that's going to be deployed. Uh, but all these changes will be automatically reconciled. So we don't really have to interact anyway with uh, the cluster or uh, the, the, the team's repository after we set things up, because all Flux is going to do is gonna, it's going to reconcile or it's going to synchronize from its fleet temper repository. And it's going to apply the new tenant configuration that it's committed to uh, the repository. And then it's going to go off to the next Git repository and for the tenant B and synchronize the, uh, the manifest and configurations from there. So now the Terraform has completed, we can actually jump in and look what's been uh, changed here. So jump into production database or production namespace for uh, the B tenant and let's get the ingresses. And you can see, oh, great, an ingress has been applied to the cluster. We can get pods. And we can see that we have our guestbook application running with Redis. If we jump and get the DNS name, we're now seeing the guestbook application running here. So what has actually happened? Well, if we go to our fleet temper repository and we refresh the page, we can see there is a new dev B YAML file that's been applied by Terraform. Uh, this creates the new tenant configuration with new role bindings to a different namespace and a new Git repository. And then from there on, Fleet Infra uh, repo kind of loses responsibility over what else is created here. So then Flux is going to reconcile this Git repository and look at the B tenants repository. And here we see, in, for example, production that we have created an ingress resource uh, for guestbook, a certificate. And we have our base here, and the base is deploying our guestbook application. So all this is basically automatically reconciled. So from, from the tenant's perspective, they have their own entry point into the cluster that is configured by the cluster administrator. 
To successfully introduce Flux, it requires buy-in from all participants. Uh, initially, Flux can seem a bit foreign in the way that it works to some people, and it's mostly because it, it strays away initially from the traditional CD promotion pipeline where you have a first deployment to a dev environment, and then a QA, and then a production, and there's like a logical pipeline of, of promotion. Um, in it, one of the earlier issues with Flux was that there was no feedback loop between a commit and uh, an actual successful deployment. Uh, today, Flux has a, a component called a notification controller. Uh, what it can do is that it can link together uh, the reconciliation events from a specific commit to feedback the actual status of that deployment. So in this image to the left here, we have a git history of commits. And for each commit, you will have Flux will reconcile that commit, and then it will post the status of that commit back to your Git provider, if it's GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, or Bitbucket. Uh, this uses the same APIs that the CI does, so it shows up as a green check mark or a red cross uh, if it's unhealthy. So as you can see here, this commit would be reconciled, and it might be that your application has a bug in it, or that uh, it can't pull the image and then the, the reconciliation would eventually fail because the health checks fail and it would post back a unhealthy uh, commit status back to it. So with this feature implemented, uh, it, it reaches a, a middle point between the new GitOps deployment methodologies and maybe the older ways where there, there are very big benefits of, of getting a feedback between a commit and a success or failure, which used to be missing in, in, in Flux, but isn't anymore. Uh, what's also cool with this uh, feature is that we're now able to build promotion flows around this without actually needing access to uh, the cluster. Everything is pulled in by Flux, so Flux just needs access to the Git repositories, but also the feedback is posted by Flux, so there's nothing going back to the cluster to check the actual deployment. So in theory, what you can do is you can have a pipeline configuration that after a change to a dev manifest, it could take that change, create a PR to the QA manifest, and wait for the dev chain commit to have a successful status posted back. So we, we can actually demo this now. Uh, if we go here, and what, what I've hit here is the pod info uh, application that I've for. And if we jump into the code quickly, and then um, we can change the color of the background, let's say, There we go. Add this change, change background color, push the code. So this will trigger a, a CI pipeline that's going to build a Docker image, and then it will trigger a promotion flow. If we get the ingress and we jump to our browser, so this is currently running the, the older pod info version. We can see this in QA and production. So if we could jump to pipelines, I think we're all familiar with, with this type of, of, of build scenario where we're just building a Docker image. Um, what, what's different here is that we have our uh, tenant day GitOps repository. So the tenant A is the one deploying the pod info application. Uh, if we jump into apps and dev, there is a uh, override of the image tag here. This annotation is a, a custom annotation used by the tooling uh, that runs in our CI to update. Uh, you could also, in theory, do these types of promotion flows with image automation controller as it becomes more stable. Uh, I think currently it's in a uh, beta or alpha release, uh, but probably soon it will 
it will reach a, a more stable version that, that will come by default in Flux. Um, so what, what, what our goal is here is that after the pipeline has been built, we want to update the tag override in this dev customization. And after that, is, that change has been synchronized into the cluster, we obviously want to go forward and move this tag override to the QA environment and then to the production environment. Uh, and that's what we built here is that we built a, a, a CI chain that falls outside of Kubernetes and outside of Flux. So this is something that you have to build yourself. Uh, but what it, what it enables you and it shows you is that there are a lot of possibilities here. And I don't, I don't think there is a one good way or best way of doing this. I think it, you have to build these type of things to, to fit your, your type of use case. So we're just going to wait for the build to complete now. So the build is now completed and we can jump over to our dev environment and we can see that it is now updated. Hopefully we will also see a change being done in QA. Um, so if we jump into our commits in the tenant a GitOps repository, uh, we can see a couple of things here. So one of the things is that we have our status objects on our commit, and this looks slightly different from GitHub, GitLab, and uh, other Git providers. But uh, as we can see here, these three commits or statuses are sent by Flux. So we see our apps, dev, QA, and production that are post it back when a change is synced and successfully applied. We can now maybe see that, yeah, let's wait for QA. So what is happening is that we're running a, a, a pipeline that is creating pull requests for us. So if you look at completed pull requests, we can see here is a pull request that changes the image tag. So after this pull request can be automatically uh, completed, if a status check passes, we can merge it and the change will then be applied to the cluster. Um, so this allows us to build a promotion flow outside of having access to the cluster itself. And here we can see also that QA has updated and maybe production will eventually update, update too. And this is all done by by our commit status feature. So the commit status, as I said before, uh, as changes are reconciled, it will it actually knows the hash of the commits that it's reconciling. So that way we can post the status of the commit back to the cluster, back to the Git repository. And then it's kind of up to you. You have all the opportunity and all the options to to build whatever automation tools or non automation tools you want around this feature. But the, the main thing here that is it, it closes the loop in the same way that a, a traditional continuous delivery pipeline would. From operations perspective, a major benefit of running Flux is that you have the options of doing proper blue-green deployments of clusters without having to cooperate with all your developers to re-trigger pipelines. If you weren't using Flux and you'd have multiple continuous delivery pipelines that were pushing applications into your cluster. If you wanted to set up a new cluster, you'd have to tell all your developers to basically re-trigger those and target the new cluster. Instead, with Flux, all you do is set up the new cluster, point it to the exact same Git repositories, allow it to sync, and you're set to go. So these things could, in theory, be run during after hours behind the backs of the end users or the clusters, and the next morning, they wouldn't even realize that they had a new cluster in the first place. To demo this, let's actually run a new cluster and see what happens. So we're going to first plan and apply our new cluster. And then we're also going to update the DNS records because external DNS is creating our DNS records. So we need to allow the new external DNS instance in the new cluster to take over these DNS records and point it to the new load balancer. So let's just first wait for our cluster to be planned and applied. Okay, so the cluster has now been created and everything's been provisioned. So if we just check, we've now configured a new context, we have two clusters, AKS2 and AKS1. In AKS2, we have our pod info deployments. If we jump back to AKS1, we should see we also have them running here. If we then scale our deployments down in AKS1, because 
uh, DNS has triggered, uh, we should now reach the other cluster. As you can see, certificates haven't been provisioned yet, uh, but that might take a, a couple of more minutes. Um, but but this is basically a, a blue green deployment without any interaction. We can actually look, for example, in our old cluster and see that we have, or our new cluster, sorry, and see that we have all our namespaces here now deployed again. So that's all for today, folks. Thank you all for joining. If you want to get involved or start a discussion uh, within the Flux project, uh, I recommend going to the discussions in GitHub. And if we're also on Slack, so the Flux and Flagger Slack channel uh, is where you can find us. Um, yeah, thank you. And I hope I will see you there. <laughs>